five year. Um, it starts uh, adding up, and that has a lot to do with the presentation that we gave to council just a uh, uh, past two hours previous to this meeting about water and wastewater models. A lot of our projects are now starting to be driven out of our water and wastewater models, capacity needs, repair needs, uh, things like that. So on the water side, you're starting to see those come in. Uh, a few items that have come in, the Clear Creek Bridge water line, TxDOT has analyzed and said the bridge over Clear Creek at Country Club is going to be replaced. And they're funding that 90%. We only have to pay 10%. It's an off-system bridge replacement program. Our water line is attached to the side of that bridge. So for that to happen, I have to we have to be able to pay to replace that water line. So it'll be an enhancement, but that's required because TxDOT does not replace utilities on the sides. So uh, that's why that project's new. Um, as we start heading through, uh, another one we found through the water model, and I love to be able to say this, is that the Green Tea repump station that was put in way uh, back in 2000-ish um, with regards to when we were getting water from the Clear Brook City Mud. Well, that's no longer needed. We've never, we have not used that connection any time in the last 10 years that I know of. And then this pump station with our modeling has found that we do not need it. We were able to supply enough pressure and enough ability without having to repressurize. So this is a time to be able to take an, an asset that's aging that would have to be poured into to remove it from the system and be better effective. Uh, and that's what our water model shows. The other one is, is that we're starting to look at small diameter water main replacements like at Somersetshire is to remove small water mains, enhance our fire protection ability to them in those subdivisions. Um, and eventually towards the end you'll see is that we're starting to look at um, water tank maintenance. Uh, we already have that spread throughout the years, but uh, the new one that's added in because it's in 26 is Alice to repaint the elevated storage tank. We'll head to wastewater. If there's no questions on water, I'll head to wastewater. Great. Uh, this one has had some surprising changes, and I say that just because of our wastewater model that was finished in 2020, right in time for us to go through a capital revitalization or doing our capital improvement program to revitalize and then revitalize lift stations, prioritize them. And that's what our biggest changes are in our wastewater program is the need to start looking at our wastewater lift stations. And evaluating. We have 70 lift stations in the system and we evaluated 61 of them because nine of them have just been replaced, repaired within the last couple of years. So we evaluated the remaining 61 and showed the priority of ascension of, of repairs, not priority, priority of repairs going from critical, red, poor condition all the way to good. And you're starting to see that now where those critical in nature are ones that we're hitting for next year. So the last that we have that are in the red or very poor condition Critical if they do fail are these last uh, three that are right here from Bella Vita, Autumn Lake, Sunrise. Those are our last three in the red based off of our uh, wastewater uh, master plan. And then we're starting to transition those along the way. Um, like I said, this you can just see the amount of yellow, but it's due to our, our wastewater model. These are all new projects that have come in within the last now since that time in 2020. Are some of these in response to the freeze issues? No, sir. No, these were prior to? Well, these are all strictly associated with capacity, evaluation through our wastewater model, um, and then also site visits and site assessments of the nature of that lift station. Is it in proper working order? Is it failing in any way? Do we have critical nature? Is it a regional lift station that if it does go down, then we have more critical issues due to potential sanitary sewer overflows. So you would anticipate probably if you looked at this and maybe the regular surface water because of the issues made with the flood going forward, there may be some additional changes once you get in there. Well, there will be some additional changes in terms of just upsizing our pumps or doing those things associated on wastewater. The other thing we take a look at, because I know you're tying a little bit on the, on the freeze with the water system, mm -hmm. is as we look at generators, is that we're winterizing those generators to be able to handle that, to take weather steps. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to build the generator to handle Michigan-type weather, sure. but I'm going to handle the generator to be able to handle some of those where I look at heater blankets for the batteries, I look at um, additives in the fuel, I look at how those things take a look where we do a little bit to knock off um, that freeze, but I'm not going to bring a Michigan generator down here. Sure. 
Understood. Thank you. But yes, we look at those, but generators are only on lift stations are used for regional lift stations and sub-regional lift stations of a critical nature. Local lift stations are still, we'll go tow behind, do a quick connect, pump it down, and get it to the next one. So that way we don't have a plethora of generators that may add to that. We don't need 70 generators in our lift stations. Um, with that, commissioners, uh, wastewater usually ends. <laughs> it's, it's kind of uh, prophetic, but uh, our wastewater is the last item on the CIP. <laughs> Um, but with that, is there any further questions? Otherwise, um, at this time, then it becomes a, an action item by you to provide a, a recommendation associated to the city manager saying that you're in agreement with that. Uh, Mr. Martin over here has, uh, usually has that letter prepared, a simple letter to say, we agree and move forward with that. And then I can put that into record and get that off to the city manager when he presents the CIP, uh, in the future one at our June meeting, but then also official in September with the new budget and that it's been presented and follows our city charter. Just one small observation or question. I guess first, how many lift stations are there within the city? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Commissioner, we have 70 lift stations. We're down from 93. So we started with 93 many years ago uh, through development that has occurred and gone and, and move towards those lift stations, looking at our wastewater models and how we can maybe deepen our sanitary sewer lines. Uh, we've gone from 93 down to 70. Our goal has continued to be able to reduce, but we're starting to um, uh, not see, be able to see that as effectively as we did when new development was coming in. Sure. And I, I noticed there's probably about, I, I just did a quick count, approximately 15 yellow lift stations or highlighted yellow. So that's significant still. If you would like to give me just a second, um, let me show you something from a previous presentation that we just had with council. This is something to for you to see here. So let me blow this up. So with this, this was our 61 lift stations we assessed through our through the um, wastewater master plan. They visited every single one, and that comes down to. Was the coating in good condition? Was the pipe in good condition? Is the site good? Is the, what size pumps? How old are the pumps? Is the electrical panel dying uh, or breaking up, literally? So you can rank them. And then the other is, too, is, that, is it next to a stream or a creek or a bayou? Is it next to a waterway? Um, those would become very high impact for failure because now I'm impacting a waterway if that lift station fails. Um, or is it a moderate impact? Is it next to a school? Is it next to... Uh, something of critical nature that if it goes down, it'll it'll have ra have other ramifications associated with it. So they're all ranked here according to that. From then, of course, the top line is condition. Is it very good to very poor? And you'll see those items in red, as you mentioned, sir. Is that um, as I uh, also as I mentioned too, is that uh, Colon Boulevard Colon Boulevard was already done. We just finished that this year. Miller Ranch was just awarded for construction. Um, Shadow Creek is being uh, uh, designed right now, and we'll be looking to go out for a, a contractor soon. The remaining four are being requested in the 22 budget, so we can get out of the red. Now, lift station rehab is secular. Just because I get them out of the red and they move to green, the yellow start move, the orange starts moving to red, and now you go back again. It's like doing a brake job on your on your car every 80,000 miles. I got to replace the brake pads. And eventually, I got to fix the rotors. This aspect is the same thing. After about 20 years, I'm back here doing this again. And so it just rotates through. So it never goes away. And that's why we want to try and reduce as many lift stations as we can because it's continual. But we're getting to that point where we're not seeing that uh, dramatic, dramatic change of reduction anymore. Was it one of these lift stations that failed during the hurricane like a couple of years ago? Um, was that a okay, so if we want to talk about Hurricane Harvey with 48 inches yeah. of water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, 40, so really? It died. Yeah. Okay. We had a lot underwater. Now, they were all pumping. Those that were below, that were uh, sub submersible pumps, that you'll say, those that were submersible pumps and the electrical panels were above water and electricity was still going because we did, we still had electricity. They would pump and they'll work, but they're just pumping whatever's flowing in and going off to their next discharge but yeah those, that's a challenging storm
So, Martin, moving forward, do we just um, do we make a motion or Lawrence? Sorry. I'd recommend somebody make a motion to approve the CIP as presented. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Dansby, I recommend we uh, approve the CIP as presented. Uh, Commissioner Ford, just a second. Right. I heard Commissioner Earls talk. Um, we have a motion from Dansby, Commissioner Dansby, and a second from Commissioner uh, Fortes. If um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Um, Commissioner Boswell? Aye. Commissioner Earls? Aye. Motion carries seven to zero. Lawrence, was that? Okay. Thank you very much, commissioners, for your time tonight. No, thank you. Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank, thank you, Mr. Upton. You had big, big shoes to fill with uh, Trent from the when I was on five years. You, you did a great job. Is very nice. Was thank you. Very educational. Thank yeah. you. All right. Okay. So now we're moving backwards in our agenda. Um, new business item A. Uh, consideration and possible action this is a conditional use permit um, application CUP number 21-00011. This is a request by A. Ron Thrower, applicant on behalf of uh, Amrit SPF Shadow Creek LP owner for approval of a conditional use permit CUP for a liquor package store located within the general commercial GC district to accommodate a liquor retail store. Uh, within a corner tenant space of the HEB Shopping Center on approximately 0 0.094 acres of land. Uh, the general location is 2803 Business Center Drive, Suite 127, Pearland, Texas. Um, yeah. We have a motion and a second, please. Uh, Commissioner Fortes, motion to approve. Uh, Commissioner Dansby, second. A uh, motion and a second staff report, please. Thank you. Um, so for uh, these conditional use permits, um, Florence, give me just a moment there. Uh, so we'll start off uh, that the purpose of these uh, items are to uh, allow the establishment of uses which may be suitable only in certain locations uh, within a certain zoning district or category. Uh, and that it's only when they are subject to those standards uh, or conditions that uh, the PNZ or the city council deem appropriate to uh, have a join with this new use. Uh, the CEP process allows uh, for PNZ and city council to uh, evaluate uh, based on conditions and then implement uh, conditions for approval where necessary. Uh, up for tonight, uh, we'll have uh, this first conditional use permit, uh, and Florence will present uh, the staff recommend or the staff uh, report on it, uh, and I will hand it over to our planner. Thank you. Could I, could I ask a question first? Just could I, could I ask a first? Point of clarification, and this might be a Lawrence question. Since we are hearing a CUP for the first time, it's not in a joint council. When it was a joint council, we just listened and made comments. We didn't vote or anything like that. So in this case, we we have a motion and a second. I made the motion to approve. Do I need to change that? No, sir. However, after listening to the staff presentation and the applicant presentation and any comments provided, if you want, if anybody wants to amend that motion at that time, they can do so. So um, if people during the discussion say, no, we don't want this here, then you know somebody can say, well, let's just vote on it and everybody could vote accordingly. Or if they say, well, based on the presentation, we think that these conditions are appropriate, um, then somebody would move to uh, amend the motion to approve by adding whatever those conditions might be. So um, as it stands now, it's on, the agenda as a motion to approve, and that may change after you hear all of the discussion. I guess my my main question is, from a procedural standpoint, we didn't vote prior. We just made comments, and tonight we are going to actually vote. 
Correct. So your vote is going to end up being a recommendation, kind of, uh, very similar to what your vote would be on a zone change. Your vote is a recommendation to council, and then council, with your recommendation, makes the final decision. Okay. Thank you. Lawrence. Thank you. Um, good evening, Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Florence Buaku, and I'm with the Community Development Department. So this request is for a conditional use permit for a liquor slash package store in the Shadow Creek Town Center, uh, specifically the HEB Shopping Center. The location is 2803 Business Center Drive um, in Pearland, and the proposed use is for a liquor store. And so far, staff has not received any comments in favor or against the proposed request. The subject property for the proposed request is zone general commercial, and it allows the liquor store use by an approved conditional use permit. It is surrounded by um, similarly zoned properties all around. The um, underlying future land use for the subject property is 288 Gateway, and that uh, shopping center is supported by the future land use. So here is an aerial view of um, the HEB shopping center. The, the proposed location for the liquor store is shown in red as is on the west wing and is in the southwest corner. Across the street is a similar shopping center um, development. So moving on. So this is a more zoomed uh, in view of the west wing of the shopping center. Again, the liquor store um, is shown in red. Um, I just want to note here that the West Side Library, which came up earlier um, in Mr. Upton's presentation, is located within this West Wing. And um, another business that is housed in the West Wing is the Pediatric Night Urgent Care Center. So these are views of um, the shopping center to the left, both top and bottom, is the proposed uh, location of the liquor store. And the rest of the images show um, various wings of the HEB shopping center. The bottom right corner is the location of the West Side Library. So staff looked at um, the location of other liquor stores in relation to the proposed um, location. And, and there is one liquor store within a mile of the proposed liquor store. Uh, there's one right outside the one mile uh, radius, and there are two others within the two mile radius. So essentially, one within the one mile radius and three within the two mile radius. Staff has viewed um, the proposal based on its conformance with our, uh, our plan and our requirements. And so basically it meets the comprehensive plan and future land um, plan. It will not have any impact on the welfare plan because it's in an existing shopping center. The property is already platted and there are utilities available for the subject. And staff has reviewed this request according to the criteria established in the Unified Development Code for approving a conditional use permit. We find that the proposed use is consistent with the future land use comprehensive plan and it's also consistent with the intent of general commercial zoning district. Uh, 
we do not anticipate any adverse impact on existing development, and we believe that it meets the standard uh, of the zoning district. I just want to make note here that even though the library and the pediatric night clinic are located within the same um, development, the ordinance for alcoholic beverages that does not prohibit adjacency to um, a library or a pediatric clinic. And so with that, uh, staff finds that the proposed request is consistent with the approval uh, for a conditional use for a liquor supply uh, package. So an such staff recommends approval of the conditional use. Thank you. Thank that you. concludes that report. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I believe that the um, somebody is here. Um, not the owner. Is Mr. Um, the applicant is here? I can't, I've lost his name. Mr. Thrower is here. Hi, Chair, members of the commission, Ron Thrower here, representing the landowner as well as the uh, future tenant for the space, which would be Twin Liquors. And I just wanted to um, to say that we had looked at the surrounding area at 300 feet and 1,000 feet and found nothing that we felt was in conflict, uh, no schools, no daycares, no churches or the like. And I, I think you'll find that Twin Liquors, who has uh, over 100 stores throughout Central Texas and Dallas and Fort Worth and also in the Houston area that they are a, a steward um, of the properties that they take very good care of the property and their their philanthropic endeavors they'll spread throughout the community and um, one thing that I've certainly been able to see is that Twin Liquors follows HEB almost everywhere that they go so we have done uh, many conditional use permits and zoning cases for Twin Lakers in proximity to HEB. And uh, I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak? I didn't have anybody signed up okay. in addition. All right, commissioners, do you all have any questions or comments for staff or for Mr. Holder? I mean, Mr. Thrower, sorry. Uh, Lawrence, what's the timing on when the library is open again? Do you think they'll be completed with construction, be able to move over from their current location? Yeah. I, no. uh, I thought he was saying in October, but it's supposed to be December, so they were a little bit ahead of schedule. They're ahead of schedule, okay. So, so I, I don't remember how far ahead of schedule. I would, I, I mean, I hesitate just microscopically full-blown approval just because uh, just something in my head about a library being feet away from a liquor store. I know it's, but th there's really just a small overlap, I think, is the issue. Because by the time they do their build out, you know, get their occupancy certificate, it may be about the same time frame, I would imagine. It's going to take them, how long do you think it would take them to get in there up and running? Hopefully the uh, <laughs> applicant's not listening and hold us to that. I don't know how long it would take them, but I mean, it's a retail space. So setting out a retail space um, normally doesn't take that long. I mean, we do our, our tenant occupancy rather quickly. Mr. Thrower is representing the applicant is still on the line and he may have a better idea of when they hope to move in and be operational though. Hi chair, members of the commission, Ron Thrower here. Um, Typically, what I've seen Twin Liquors do is they could have their doors open in 60 days up to 120 days. It just depends on the complexities of the tenant finish out. This one's a little bit bigger. Um, I would think that it would probably be leaning more to the 120 day side of things. Okay, sir. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Thank you. Commissioner Boswell. Did you have questions or comments? Yes, um, for my comments, I'm, I'm not too concerned with this because Shadow Creek Liquor is in the same uh, shopping center as 
tutoring uh, company, as well as literally down the street from a school. So the fact that it's near a library doesn't concern me because we have a liquor store that's near where kids come and go. Um, and there is only going to be a small overlap from what has been previously stated. So I'm really not that concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Earls. Uh, thank you. I'm fine. I had some concerns, but Commissioner Dansby and Boswell helped me with both of those. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had some questions too, but they've all been answered for me. So that was handy. All right. Well, um, I don't see any other questions or comments. So I do have just again, I'm, I'm back to that. That box. Um, if we vote to approve or not approve, because we weren't voting before, does this put any kind of super majority impact on the council, or is this just more of a recommendation type? No, sir. It, it's more of a recommendation. There is no super majority element to this particular vote. Um, it, really, what you're saying is PNC heard this. Uh, I believe Shelby has been tracking down your comments because we've talked about trying to provide some sort of enhanced communication regarding the CUPs. Um, and then your vote is simply saying that uh, you recommend approval of this CUP. And then if you don't recommend approval or if there aren't any conditions, I, I would hope that city council would then look at that uh, with a different level of scrutiny as they go to do it. They may go back, watch the meeting, or they may review the comment depending on what had happened. Uh, I'm not sure Martin, I think, helped craft that legislation, so he might have a different idea of what he was thinking, and I'll turn it to him. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I was going to essentially repeat a lot of what Lawrence said. We will be sending out a communication uh, tomorrow uh, with a, a draft of y'all's comments um, for each commissioner to review their own comments, not to cross-reference each other's comments. Um, but to, to provide to make sure that we are uh, sending forward the your correct comments and that we didn't it, misinterpret what you wanted said or what you wanted discussed. Um, so that is something that we'll be moving forward with. And uh, thank you for bringing that up as this is a, a new uh, process and procedure for, um, for the commission. Um, and I'd love to be able to explain that. So thank you. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> then if I could add one more comment since Shelby's taking awesome notes. Um, <clears throat> every tenant that is there currently signed an agreement with AM Reed or whoever the uh, owner of the entire facility is, including HEB and including the space that was there and, and this current tenant that's trying to come in. Um, some of those tenants, including the city library, when the city negotiated a lease, they could have had exclusions or um, uh, not exclusivity. I'm not, I'm not trying to mention exclusivity, but saying that um, I'll come in and sign the lease as long as there's no other business that ABC. And that, that does happen. And, and, and landlords are sometimes, uh, you know, they can't have certain businesses. And this wasn't, although it wasn't, legal to do it before, I don't believe. So maybe it wasn't thought, but but some of these businesses that were concerned about the library and the urgent care or the pediatric this and that, uh, and, I, and I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what it was. They could have excluded or had AM REIT agree not to have a liquor store in the, in the business or their tenancy or their business. So um, unfortunately, uh, that's my, that, that kind of helped sway me along with the library leaving shortly thereafter. This is Commissioner Henricks. My only comment is that we already have another HEB with a liquor store and we just approved a liquor store next to Kroger's and I think this is one of the most ideal locations for a liquor store if there's going to be an ideal location. And I'm not concerned at all about the library being so close because it is going to move. And I just wanted to make those comments. All right. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? 
Carol? No? No? Okay. Um, so moving forward, we'll, we'll take a vote um, to record our feelings on this for council. Okay. So all those in favor of the CUP, signify by raising your right hand. Okay. Commissioner Boswell? Uh oh Mr. Boswell, we couldn't hear you. Your mic is on, but I don't hear you. Yeah. Commissioner Earls? Aye. Thank you. You're unmuted right now, Commissioner Boswell, if you want to say something. I said I. I'm sorry if you didn't hear me the first I time. I didn't. I'm, I didn't hear you. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. So, That's okay. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, our our the planning and zoning commission recommendation would be seven to zero for it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So moving on in our agenda to we now item B. Item. I turned around because we're kind of out of order. Item B. Uh, consideration and possible action. This conditional use permit application, uh, item number CUP, no, yeah, CUP, I've lost it, 21 00013. This is a request by Anthony E. Edie, um, applicant and owner, for approval of a conditional use permit, CUP, for an accessory dwelling located within the residential estate RE district to accommodate the construction of a 1,600 square foot dwelling unit to serve as a private living quarters for grandparents on approximately 2.439 acres of land. Um, the general location is 2317 Bryan Court in Pearland. Um, can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Thank you. I second, Commissioner Earls. Thank you, I got a motion from Commissioner Eisenberg and a second from Commissioner um, Earls. Staff report. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cade. Uh, going for uh, this uh, staff report, uh, I'll introduce Muhammad uh, to uh, present the report. And we do have uh, two uh, people afterwards uh, for the applicant presentation. Thank you. Muhammad, take it away. Thank you, Martin, um, Madam Chair, and members of the commission. Good evening. Uh, this request, as you mentioned, is, uh, is, is, a, is a conditional use permit request for accessory dwelling unit located within the residential state, also known as RE district, to accommodate the construction of uh, a 1,600 square foot accessory dwelling unit to serve as private living quarters. Uh, this will be built in conjunction of uh, the principal house that will be uh, uh, develop on the property. Uh, the um, applicant proposes to construct approximately 5,000 or 5,500 square foot single family home on the property and will be connected with a port of to this 1,600 square foot uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, staff has not received any correspondence uh, regarding this request. Uh, any, any public comments? We have not received anything. Uh, on uh, the zoning map, uh, again, as I said, the property is zone uh, RE, uh, residential state. Um, it is uh, the property, it is uh, surrounded by the RE zoning district from uh, all four sides of the property, as well as single family homes from all four sides. Uh, on the future land use map, uh, the property is designated as suburban residential. And the next slide should be the site plan uh, showing um, the development, uh, the proposed construction of uh, this 5,500 square foot main house uh, in conjunction with this accessory dwelling units of approximately 1,600 square foot uh, connected with uh, this uh, Porto Cashier or uh, Breezeway um, and will be living quarters for extended family. Um, on the review criteria, um, uh, I should, uh, well, this is our views of the subject property. 
uh, the one on the left side is uh, view of the, uh, the existing driveway that will be serving this uh, uh, house uh, along uh, Bryan Court. And on the right, uh, lower right side is the side of the proposed uh, where the, the new home will be built. Uh, the next slide is a um, how the property uh, conforms to uh, our uh, review criteria, like the future land use map and uh, the thoroughfare plan, the platting and utilities. So the property is platted. Uh, this uh, Bryan Court is a residential street, uh, so it's consistent with the thoroughfare plan as, as well as consistent with the uh, future land use plan. Utilities um, are available along uh, Hughes Ranch Road, approximately a distance, but it uh, seems like uh, the, the applicant is willing to extend that water and sewer, get it to his property. Uh, next slide is the cri approval criteria. Uh, the proposed use is consistent with this approval criteria and staff recommends approval of the request. Uh, and Next is like Martin. Uh, right, uh, we don't have any uh, additional condition associated with this, and uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission will be making a recommendation for the City Council on this request. Uh, tentative date for City Council uh, June 14. That concludes staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eady. Oh, well, we have uh, our project manager to speak for us. Okay, thank uh, you. Mr. McDaniels. Okay, thank you. Mr. McDaniels? No, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, one comment or question. Um, it was just said by uh, Mr. Muhammad that utilities were available at Hughes Ranch and the applicant was okay with extending those services uh, to the property. Uh, my question at this point was, uh, our initial discussions with the, with the applicant was uh, providing a sewer, uh, well and septic rather than domestic uh, water and sewer uh, that would be consistent with the other uh, adjacent properties and properties surrounding that that project, uh, would there be any objections to that, or is that something we've got to we got to move forward with as far as getting those facilities down there? That should be handled during the building permit process. It will not be an issue for this particular condition conditional use permit. So this will authorize okay. the use. Everything else will have to comply with whatever the city standards are, and if. If there are folks who are using water and sewer out there, whether that be a well and a septic system, or whether that be something where they have to take it from these city utilities, the building permit, or the permit will be uh, Great. reviewed at that time. And the criteria is Thank simply you. I just based to on make the, sure the, the. Sorry, the criteria is simply based on the ability for the site to be serviced by utilities in general. Uh, you know, so to be able to provide either water or septic on the site, um, which can be handled either through private uh, services or through city services. But for the CUP purposes, that that doesn't change doesn't our change recommendation. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. I just want to make sure that that uh, that statement uh, we wouldn't be held to that uh, that that statement since this is uh, being recorded. Um, it was a good question. So, Thank um, you. Absolutely. Uh, that that was the only question we had. I I think the uh, I, I think uh, what Mr. Uh, Muhammad presented was consistent with with the plan for development. Uh, it's a one family with several generations living grandparents. So there are three generations of the same family. And the the grandparents would like to have their their own separate quarters uh, from the main house still to join uh, with the use of a vertical share or a uh, a breezeway 
uh, to connect both structures and the intended use of the property will be that will be the continued use of the property for its uh, for the duration of both structures. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments for staff or for um, applicant? Excuse me, Chair Cade. There was a, uh, a person who had signed up to speak about this tonight, uh, LaDonna Randall. I'm sorry. She's also inside the notification area. I don't see her online right now, but um, I, I do want to at least acknowledge that she had signed up to speak. And um, if she is one of the folks who had signed up to speak and is here, but it's not under her name, if you just kindly raise your hand so we could be, uh, raise your digital hand rather, so that we could be sure to call on you, Ms. Randall. Ms. Randall? Not hearing anything and not seeing any digital hand, hands raised in the attendee list, uh, I think we've done our due diligence in calling upon her, Chair Cade, and okay. uh, now suggest you move on to the staff applicant discussion, okay. commission staff applicant discussion. All right. Sorry, I forgot about her. Um, commissioners, any questions or comments? I, I think Commissioner Eisenberg has a question or comment. I understand that, that this particular applicant, all he wants to do is put in a mother-in-law's quarters, which I'm fine with that. But, um, you know, let's say years down the road, somebody else moves in there. Um, I would feel a whole lot better if we put an addendum on this or amendment to it that, that stated that no no rent can be charged for living in that, that mother-in-law's quarters. Um, Later on down the road, somebody moves in there. What would stop them from from uh, renting that property out to somebody? And, and that could be a perfectly valid uh, condition that you put on it to make sure that it adheres to the single family residential. If they start, if they introduce somebody other than a family member uh, into that, it, it would tend to not be a single family residential type issue, and it would violate the zoning district. Uh, a lot of times in other communities, we've seen people either try to uh, set the accessory dwelling as a short-term rental, listing it with an agency, or just trying to rent it to supplement the, their income, which all we understand would seem to violate the zoning district principles. So um, if you want to move to amend this, amend the motion to approve to say, uh, as you said, that uh, it it can't be used for persons other than family members or it can't be used, uh, it can't be rented to uh, un somebody else. Uh, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Make that recommendation and do so uh, after the, the rest of the discussion. Okay. That would include something like an Airbnb. That would include anything like that. Like that. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, that was my question. Does that exclude Airbnb? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes, Chair Cade and yes, Commissioner Earls. Uh, if you were to attach a condition of that sort, it would exclude those types of listings with, and we just call it short-term rental. Uh, it doesn't have to be short-term rental. I mean, somebody, I think if I understand the concern correctly, whether somebody rents an accessory dwelling out for a weekend or whether they rent it out for a year, it has the ability to change the character of the zoning district. And that's, if I understand you correctly, that's where your concern is. I think uh, just putting an addendum on there that says no compensation can be received on the dwelling would be would cover all that. Uh, yes, sir. Daryl, you want to make that motion? Okay. J just in case there were any other discussion yes. items and any yeah. additional we'll come back motions so we don't have to make multiple motions and keep track of them, I, I recommend continuing the discussion. Okay. All right. Anybody else questions or comments? Okay, go ahead. And, and Daryl should make that because he was the one that uh, made the motion to right. begin with. And if Commissioner Earls seconds it, then, then we'll let him. Se right, he'll let him second it. <clears throat> um, I, I guess my question is, and, and it's to Martin. We had discussions maybe a year ago, nine months ago, about accessory dwellings and defining them and <clears throat> I guess what puts what's different about this CUP request dwelling and accessory dwelling definition than 
houses in Stonebridge that I pass up, and there's a porta cachet and a living quarters to the right, and the houses to the left. What's what makes this different? Good question, uh, Commissioner Fortes. So the the key difference is that an accessory dwelling unit has all three parts of a dwelling unit to it. So it has a place to live, it has a, a facility to uh, use, and it also has a kitchen uh, to be able to prepare food. So this dwelling unit can essentially be a full uh, residence by itself, but it is accessory to and tied back to the primary residence. So these other ones that may be in Stonebridge or houses I've seen, these these they are large foot square foot homes and in, in, in substantial size. Uh, I don't know what to call them if I can't call them an accessory. <laughs> um, I'm assuming that those maybe don't have a restroom or. or uh, Something like they're that. missing some part of that, so that way it's just an accessory structure to the residence. Not an uh, for instance, place. having a, a, a big garage, for, you know, for your car collection or a shop or some uh, a pool house. All of those are just accessory residential structures because they're missing that third component. Okay, I I, I honestly don't have a problem with it. I, I'm glad you brought up the lease. I I, I was thinking of a way to protect the uh, integrity of the area. But two and a half acres, I, I, I honestly don't have a big issue here. This is Commissioner Boswell. Um, I guess my comment is I believe uniformity. And if we're going to, for CUP purposes, uh, for dwellings such as these accessory dwellings, are we moving forward? Do we want this kind of a meeting for all of them? Or are we going to pick and choose the ones that we say compensation can't be received? Because I don't have a problem with it, but I think whatever we decide to do, it needs to be uniform. It shouldn't be depending on where the area is or keeping the the uh, the structure of a community uh, basing on if you are going to put an amendment or not. So that's, I guess, my comment to the commissioners. Um, I, I just would like to see uniformity concerning this. If that is a concern, then moving forward, we agree that that's something that we're going to implement for any applicant that comes in for an accessory dwelling on a CUP. Thanks. And that makes sense. I mean, if, yeah, and it makes, so that's something that we, it can't just depend on what we would expect if that's what the commission is saying is that from here on out the com somebody on the commission recommend that as a condition of your recommendation to city council so ultimately it's still up to city council but right. that would be what your recommendation is right. and then um ideally what you end up hearing is after it happening so many times and them agreeing with you uh, there actually becomes an amendment to the udc so that you don't have to tie that condition every time, or that's how it's happened in the past, uh, where we have tied a consistent condition um, so that you don't have to go through that process. But as it stands now, CUPs are allowed in certain, but not all residential neighborhoods, residentially zoned neighborhoods. And I think the line is right when you get to RE is, I don't remember if R1 allows it or if you have to, if it's one step up to get to the RE before that land use the is The suburban allowed. residentials is what I think you're thinking of. Yeah, suburban residential. So it, it, R1 and below, I don't believe allows them, but RE and up does. They don't allow accessory dwellings at all? Right, so if you had an R4 neighborhood and somebody just wanted to convert the detached garage, if there is a detached garage in an R4 neighborhood, um, that they are not allowed that on, on your land use table, that's not there. And I, I feel like I might be stepping out of my lane, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Martin. But if, is there, are there um, any any neighborhoods in Pearland or any like um, areas in Pearland that are not necessarily neighborhoods that might have big lots that they could 
build an accessory dwelling that we would let, you know, not put that rule in effect or that amendment? So I think that's a question that I'd like to dive further into. I, I don't want to shoot from the hip on that just to have an answer for you right now. Um, and honestly, it's something that I haven't put forth a, a whole lot of thought into. Is it okay to rent in some neighborhoods that it's not okay to rent in other neighborhood or other types of land? Um, so with that, I, I think if, if that's a trail that we want to discuss down, you know, let staff come back with some research and do some thought and actually come up with something good for it rather than just, you know, how our gut reaction is feeling right now. I'm thinking more of like like some of those houses, probably in the ETJ maybe, that are, have five acres that are not even in a neighborhood. So we wouldn't regulate anything inside the ETJ in so terms of a use perspective. And while it wouldn't impact this issue in front of you tonight with this particular CUP, yeah. we would just say that all of our zoning districts, all of our residential zoning districts say single family zoning districts. So, okay. so the difficulty is, is that you are approving the construction of a dwelling that could be used to violate it. Right. But as in this case with the CUP, it's not being used to violate that restriction. So it's harder to monitor. I mean, if it becomes a short-term rental, it's pretty easy to check and see if it's violating the zoning district because there's an ad on about three or four different platforms. So from an enforcement perspective, the city can see that. But if it's not a short-term rental, if it's a long-term rental, then it's it's a lot harder to see where they place the ad or how they place the ad or if they're renting it to a friend or family, a distant family member or something like that. And then you create a a discon uh, incongruent land use from your zoning district that can negatively affect that that area that you thought was single family. Hey, hey this is Mohammed. Uh, just quick clar clarification: uh, those accessory dwelling units can go in any of the residential zoning district. It's not. Uh, limited just to the R, E, and the suburban residential. It's uh, actually can go in any of those residential districts. The only difference is the lot size. Uh, this uh, other residential district, like the R1, R2, R3, the, they're re really limited in terms of land area, and they do not have that luxury of putting those accessory structures. But the larger lots, the R, E, uh, SR15, and SR12, they have some room where they can put an accessory dwelling, and that's where we get most of the, you know, the requests if we get any. Uh, I think we have one case that was uh, uh, approved uh, last year, uh, so we haven't got that many of those cases. But uh, I just want to clarify that it, it is allowed by conditional use permit in all of the residential zoning districts. Thank you, Mohammed. Questions or comments? This is Commissioner Hendricks. Okay, so what's the difference really at the end of the day between this and a house in Baker's Landing? Where half of the house the main family lives in, the other half the mother in law or the grandparents live in. I'm not familiar with so that. But Ultimately, I mean, I know it's one structure, but ultimately you have two separate kitchens, two separate entrances, two separate bathrooms, because I've met people that have moved there and they do this with multi-generational families. And this is becoming a very popular thing, especially as cost for senior living is astronomical right now. You know, and I'm going through this with my mom. I'm full support of this. But I was just curious what the difference is between Baker's Landing and this situation. So I, I don't necessarily have a, a, a headspace or image of what a what we're talking about in Baker's Landing, but I can can tell you the difference in between a single family established home and a single family home with an accessory dwelling unit, which is essentially what this accessory residence is. Uh, that's planning lingo for those playing at home with their bingo cards, ADU. Um, the 
accessory dwelling is a separate smaller structure that is complete as a residential package by itself. Um, it is detached from the main structure. So some people uh, add on to their home and maintain a, a single kitchen so that way it's only they just they add an additional bedroom and an additional bathroom so that way they're not breaking that definition that we implemented uh, last year that said that a dwelling unit contains a place to live a place to for facilities and a um, a kitchen or a full kitchen set so uh, a lot of places will uh, do two and two thirds so that way they're not fully doing a full kitchen. They have a, a wet bar and a um, you know a sink or so, something of that nature so that way it's not a full place to prepare food. Um, but again, without knowing exactly where in Baker's Landing and seeing the site plan and being able to to dive in on that particular case, um, I, I can't necessarily describe exactly what you're talking about, but I, I hope that that's enough of a description. Hey, Martin, if I can add to that, um, for our definition for single family, any persons that are living in the same house that are rel related by blood or uh, by uh, marriage are still considered to be part of the same family. So they will be considered like other renters and people who are related. So if you have even the houses, if, 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 if you have one house that's divided and, you know, one section is occupied by the grandparents or, you know, um, anyone that's related by blood or by marriage, uh, to still consider single family, uh, will be considered, uh, two separate homes. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and also, too, I am in support of the restriction that they can't use this as a rent house. But I'm definitely in support of people being able to do this because I'm in this situation dealing with my own parent and trying to find affordable housing. And I think we have to be very open to this type of dwellings, but with restrictions on rent. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, okay. I'd like to uh, make an amendment to the CUP to read that no compensation can be received for the dwelling. The accessory well, I dwelling. I second accept that. Did you second it, Commissioner Earls? Yes. All right. We have a motion to amend from Commissioner Eisenberg and a second from Commissioner Earls. So first you vote on the amendment, then you vote on the amended motion. Okay. And even though they were moved twice, is that correct? Yes. So we still, we vote on the amendment. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment, signify by raising your right hand. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Boswell? No. Commissioner Earls? Aye. Okay. Motion passes six to one. All right. And now we're going to vote on the CUP. Before you vote on the CUP, uh, Commissioner Boswell, if you want to state your reason for your opposition so that it's sure to be reflected in the minutes, you have that opportunity to do so. Thank you. My reason for the opposition is I, I don't like the picking and choosing of which dwellings we're going to place additional restrictions on and those that we're not. So if we want to brainstorm and, and figure out how we're going to do this um, in a uniform manner moving forward, then I support that. But for ones in the past, we've never required this. So I don't support requiring it for this particular person today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And then, uh, so that was a 6-1 vote to amend the motion, and now we vote on the amended motion. Okay. So all those in favor of the amended motion, signify by raising your right hand. 
uh, Commissioner Earls? Aye. Commissioner Boswell? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Okay, so, Lawrence, we're done with that CUP, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so moving on to item C consideration and possible action for the pre preliminary plat of Yanni Garden, plat number 21-00017. This is a request of Joseph Abowd of Abowd Engineering, LLC, the applicant on behalf of Pearland 28, LLC owner for approval of the preliminary plat of Yanni Garden, creating 29 single family lots and four reserves on 11.0001 acres of land located on the west side of Hatfield Road, about 550 feet south of Orange Street. Um, can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Commissioner right. Dansby. We got a, a motion from Commissioner Eisenberg and a second from Commissioner Dansby. Um, can we get a staff report on this item? Uh, this is Vince Husted, city staff. Uh, this property, uh, is under consideration for a uh, preliminary plat. Uh, it will create 29 single family lots and four reserves uh, located on the west side of Hatfield Road, uh, south of Orange Street. Uh, this plat meets the uh, criteria for approval found in the code conformance table. Staff recommends approval of the preliminary plat of Yanni Gardens because it meets the criteria for approval of a preliminary plat found in the uh, uh, UDC for approval of preliminary plats. Uh, the next slide shows the uh, location of the applicant's property on the, um, uh, the west side of Hatfield Road. And the final slide shows the uh, configuration of the lots that would be created by the plat. And that concludes my staff presentation. Thank you. Is the applicant here to speak about this? Uh, the applicant is here. However, I believe it's Mr. Barry uh, on behalf of Abood Engineering. And he's only here to answer questions if you have any. There wasn't a, a specific applicant presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, do any of the commissioners have uh, questions or comments? Or Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Fuertes. Uh, Commissioner Fuertes, uh, yes, the streets it looks like are combining, or, or this street coming off of Hatfield is going to go east-west and combine with the, uh, the street that's, that's existing currently. Is that going to be opened up, or is that just going to be a uh, one of those fire emergency type entrance exits? Uh, my understanding is that it was going to go through. There's a note on the uh, west uh, property plat uh, that has the original Dublin Lane that allows for the continued connection of uh, this Dublin Lane. The problem I have with that, I mean, I'm just one commissioner, right? But I, I believe there's a street called Rice, and I don't know which two north and south streets it connects. Uh, it, it's uh, northward of this property. Um, it just it gets traveled uh, on, and it's uh, uh, you know there's kids playing, and it's just not a a, a good avenue for us to. Uh, pursue like this. I, I know we need a second entrance and exit, um, but these, these cut through streets become just that cut through streets and, and, and they, to me it's a danger. Anybody else? Commissioner Boswell? Nothing from me, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Earls? Nothing for me, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have anything. Um, not hearing any other questions or comments. We want to move. We can move forward. All right, um, all those in favor signify by raising your right hand. 
for sure rolls. Aye. Commissioner Boswell. Aye. Your motion passes seven to zero. All right. Um. And now we're on item D. Um, this is the consideration and possible action. It's our final plat of Pasadena ISD Thompson Intermediate School. This is plat number 21-00028. This is a request of Abraham Nimruzi on behalf of Pasadena Independent School District owner to approve the final plat of Pasadena ISD Thompson Intermediate School, creating one lot. Um, the general location is 8750 Hughes Road. A motion and a second. Commissioner Fuertes, motion to approve. Commissioner Eisenberg, second. All right, thank you. Uh, motion from Commissioner Fuertes, second from Commissioner Eisenberg. We have a staff report, please. Uh, this is Vince Husted, city staff. Uh, this item uh, is located at the uh, corner of Hughes Road and Riverstone Falls Drive. The address is 8750 Hughes Road. Uh, the next slide, um, uh, the uh, final plat does meet the criteria of approval found in the code conformance table. However, I wanna uh, point out um, a minor change that uh, to the staff report. Um, the uh, drainage plan approval and the TIA approval, uh, both those items had been submitted uh, they have not been fully approved yet, but yet the uh, engineering department is uh, uh, okay with uh, moving forward with these plats. I believe in the staff report I put that there was a drainage plan approved, but it's not really the case. It's a case of the uh, uh, drainage plan being submitted, but engineering is okay forward with moving forward with the uh, approval of the plat. Uh, the uh, uh, final plat does meet the uh, criteria of approval found in the uh, UDC for approval of a preliminary plat. Uh, the uh, next slide shows the uh, location of the uh, applicant's property at Hughes Road and Riverstone Falls Drive. And the final slide shows the uh, configuration of the lot that will be created. And that concludes my staff report. Thank you. Um, the applicant is here, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. The uh, applicant and I believe one additional design professional are both here to answer any questions you okay. may have. All right. Uh, commissioners, questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Boswell? Nothing from me. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Earls? Nothing from me. Thanks. All right. I don't have anything either. This is um, something we've been working on for a while. So. All those in favor, uh, signify by raising your right hand. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Danzig. Uh, Commissioner Earls? Aye. Commissioner Boswell? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes 7 0. Um, and then item E, we moved for, uh, to the beginning. So now, and moving on in our agenda to item six, the uh, discussion items, commissioners' activity reports. Anybody? No activity? Come on, Henry, I know you have activity. No, just thank you to, this, to Martin and, and Lawrence for uh, walking us through this new process. And uh, we had discussed also that we were going to be able to see the minutes or maybe just a couple of us or what, what did we ever decide about that? So uh, back to what I had said in the first conditional use permit, we're gonna send out an email uh, to all of the commissioners to check their own comments. So that way, um, if you made a comment, you can make sure that we captured that comment correctly um, and that you know, you're know you're providing your feedback for your comment. Um, we'll send it out as blind to everyone. Um, so that way, but well that, and we don't want, well, no, no, no. He said, or she said, it's stay in, stay in your topic of discussion because you are the master of your own, what you said out of your mouth. And just to make sure that what got into our ears is what you 
had intentions of saying. Anybody else? Commissioner Earls, Commissioner Boswell? Activity? No activity to report. Sorry. No, oh, that's okay. We we haven't been very active lately. Um, all right, our next regular planning and zoning meeting will be June seventh, twenty twenty one. Um anybody not yes, anybody else? No, no. All right. Um, Are we going to get to see Commissioner Boswell and Earls here? I hope so. Putting them on the spot. They're lovely people. Would be nice if we all. <laughs> maybe. Oh, maybe, no. Daryl and I have both seen them. Maybe. Maybe for June. I just. I. I haven't had to uh, go into work, so I didn't feel. I didn't want to come in there yet. But I, I guess I can try for June. We got plexiglass. Look, I can't touch them. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I want to smack. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Well, then at 8 12 p.m., um, meeting is adjourned. Pearland, Texas is a city looking to the future. And the future begins with well-educated, well-prepared, well-loved children. Our school districts earn high marks. Out of 48 Houston area school districts, the fourth highest ranking district is right here. We also have the eighth safest district and the ninth most diverse. What's more, we have the 25th best school district in the entire state of Texas out of over 995 others. With amazing districts serving Pearland, we have a lot to brag about. But Pearland doesn't stop with rankings. Now students can earn dual credit courses to earn college credits while in high school. And we've added and expanded career certifications achievable before high school graduation in areas ranging from veterinary science to information technology and welding. And higher education thrives here as well. We are home to the 